Right. So, so I'll start with where we are in the book. Um, a friend of mine was once took a. Oh, now there's two. A friend of mine's one once took a course at Harvard, and he was the only student in it, like a grad course, and um, he said that like he would kind of doze off and the professor would keep just keep going <laughs> and, he, and he would wake up again and the compressor was still talking and, and he he was he was thinking of asking if you know saying uh excuse me i need to go to the bathroom and see if the guy would keep talking while he was gone anyway <laughs> uh, right where are we are in the book um my setup is not ideal today, but I'll try. Right, so the doctrine of elements had these two parts, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. The transcendental analog logic has these two parts, the analytic and the dialectic. The dialectic is divided into the concepts of pure reason and the dialectical inferences. I'll just write inferences. The dialectical inferences of pure reason. And uh, so last time the reading was the introduction to the transcendental dialectic and the beginning of the concepts of pure reason. And this time, uh, uh, hey, is this even true? This time, <laughs> reading was the end of the concepts of pure reason and um, oh, sorry, I'm so discombobulated. Just need like a normal week, but I'm not gonna get it. Uh, yeah, this week was the end of the causes of pure reason and the beginning of the inferences of pure reason. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the readings aren't broken up exactly according to these divisions because they, whatever, things are not the right lane. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to start with some of the stuff that uh, I should have talked about last time um and then go on to the new material um right so there are three relations of judgments categorical I should read more reading here, right? What they are. Categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Now, I mean, uh, most of the time, the judgments that I give examples of are categorical judgments. Um, but uh, to understand what's going on with these three types of syllogism, you have to remember that there aren't only categorical judgments, there's hypothetical and disjunctive judgments. So a categorical judgment looks like A is B. A hypothetical judgment looks like 
if C is D, then A is B. And a disjunctive look, judgment looks like either A is B or C is D, and then there can be more than two, right? This is more. Or it can be more. And it's understood as um, exclusive or, right? So it means that uh, exactly one of the disjuncts has to be true. Um, and uh, as far as Kant is concerned, this is a way of, these are the three different ways that you can supply a condition for a rule. Right, because a judgment is a rule applied on a condition. Um, so, um, Okay, I'm going to give an example of these with, I'm going to give examples of these with Cinnabar, but the examples are, are weird, and I'll say why in a second. Um, so, like, as an example of a categorical judgment, we could take our old favorite, all Cinnabar is red, right? That's a categorical judgment. Um, and um, it's... So the type of condition there is internal. Um, um, it's internal, not to the concept of cinnabar. That would make it an analytic judgment. Right. In other words, if we define cinnabar as red, then all cinnabar is red. The condition is internal to the subject concept. And in that case, the judgment is analytic and the opposite of that is a contradiction. But uh, generally speaking, in a categorical judgment, the um, condition is internal to the object of the judgment. Right. So it's not internal to the concept of cinnabar, but it's internal to cinnabar. So when I say all cinnabar is red, um, I'm saying like there's something about cinnabar in virtue of which it's red. Um, so here's here's an example of a hypothetical judgment, but like I said, it's a weird example. So I can say, like, um, if cinnabar contains mercury, then it is toxic. Do I want to talk about this example at all? I mean, obviously, what's weird about this example is that C and A are the same, right? That, like, this it refers to cinnabar. So we're saying if cinnabar contains mercury, then cinnabar is toxic. Yeah, okay. I am going to talk about this example, but then like we have to keep in mind that it's a weird example. So in this example we've like um divided all possible cinnabar into two parts. Now again, if we define let's say if we define cinnabar as mercury sulfide, then uh 
then we have a really divided cinnabar into two parts, right? Because all possible cinnabar then contains mercury. But suppose that's not how we define cinnabar. So we defined, we've divided all possible cinnabar into two parts. Um, and um, one part is the part that contains mercury and the other part is the part that doesn't contain mercury. Now, I mean, this isn't a division of like the actual extent of cinnabar. I mean, like all actual cinnabar does contain mercury, presumably. Um, but when we make this judgment, we're thinking of the... Um, we're thinking of possible cinnabar as either containing mercury or not containing mercury. So we're thinking of containing mercury as a condition, like, um, like uh, logically external to cinnabar, right? We're, we're thinking of cinnabar as something that might or might not contain mercury. So again, like this internality of the condition, so it's not, it's not a question of being internal to the concept. It's not a question of being internal to the actual extent of cinnabar. It's, it's a question of being like, um, don't, I, I'm doubting whether the, I, I keep doubting whether this is even a good way to talk about it. The, I can I say why why I keep wanting to start this way, but then also thinking that no, this is not the right way to start. Well, so I mean, for one thing, it's very hard to come up with a plausible hypothetical judgment like this, like with some kind of empirical content where the um, where the subject of the two, the antecedent is not the same as the subject as the consequent, right? Like we want something like if C is D, then cinnabar is toxic, where C is not cinnabar, but something else. I mean, I mean, it could, I guess, be something like, so remember, so Kant's example of a hypothetical judgment was um, if perfect justice exists, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. So, you know, there's an example where definitely the two clauses are about different things. And the, um, and like, sure enough, the condition is external to the to the obstinately wicked, right? Like perfect justice existing is not something in particular about the obstinately wicked. Something about the world, I guess. Uh, the obstinately wicked are part of the world, but that's but but they're definitely not the subject of that judgment. So, like, it doesn't depend on something about them, whether they will be punished. Um, it depends on something that's uh, different than them. So, but, like, it's hard to think of an example that that's, that's that clear with Cinnabar. And yet, I mean... I want an example like that because Kant's example, that that example is is a practical um or is is 
contains practical concepts like justice and wicked and whatever. So it's like not part of theoretical philosophy at all, really, to consider that judgment. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you could say, I've tried this example before. If mercury is toxic, then cinnabar is toxic. So that's better because mercury is not the same thing as cinnabar. Um, although it's inside it, obviously. <laughs> um, but it's not an internal condition. So, uh, um, and, and that's, and that's actually like, it's not somehow analytic that everything that contains something toxic is toxic, right? Like chlorine is toxic, but sodium chloride, which is salt is not toxic. So, um so it's you know um uh it's because of the particular mechanism by which mercury is toxic that putting it in a compound doesn't help or something like that right so yeah so maybe this is a good example it's still not as clear as i could like because the, the mercury still is kind of inside the cinnabar but maybe you can see better that this is an external condition And I want internal and external here because both because I want um, to match the concepts of reflection, inner and outer. Um, and um, because I want to match unity versus plurality. Um, well, and also, I guess, substance and accidents versus cause and effect. Um, right? So when you say all cinnabar is red, you're saying the substance, cinnabar, uh, its nature is such as to make it red or something like that. Whereas if you say, if mercury is toxic, then cinnabar is toxic, you're saying the toxicity of mercury causes the toxicity of cinnabar. Again, not as clear as I would have liked, right? It's not as clear as if perfect justice exists, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. Um, I mean, the way it matches unity versus plurality is that, um, and this is what I was starting to say with the other example, like this one, um, this, this condition kind of divides the logical sphere of cinnabar into parts. Right, since since the toxicity of cinnabar depends on some other condition, which isn't a feature of cinnabar, um, it like um, um, it's like the difference between universal and particular judgment. Right, it's like the difference between all cinnabar is red and some cinnabar is shiny. Uh, your um,
seems almost too much like it. <laughs> like it would just be the same thing over again. Um, but of course it's not. When I say some cinnabar is shiny, I mean, so if if it if when I say some cinnabar is shiny, if that's true, and it's also true that some cinnabar is not shiny, then something like this must be true, right? That is, there must be something that makes cinnabar shiny or not shiny. Um, in that case, I guess, though, the conclusion would be singular, not universal, right? So, like, uh, this is so confusing. Kant gives no examples. Maybe I shouldn't try to develop that part. I'll I'll just say what I already said, right? That is, in a hypothetical judgment, we represent the rule as applying to the subject of the judgment on an external condition, and a, a condition that's external to the object that is subject of the judgment. So I'm taking it that the object that is subject to the judgment is the object of this concept here, or A. Um, that's not entirely clear, and it becomes a bit of a problem when we go on to the disjunctive judgment. So let me talk about the disjunctive judgment. Um, so um, of course, again, there is no third column in the concepts of reflection. In the categories, there's a third column, which is the combination of the first two. Um, but in the concepts of reflection, there is no third category that's the combination of, of inner and outer. Again, in Hegel's version, there is. I don't remember what it is. It might actually. might actually be whole and part or something like that. But in any case, um, so we have to try to understand what it means that there's that the condition is some kind of like combination of internal and external. So this, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it is important to understand this condition as breaking up possible cinnabar into two parts in order to understand what happens here. This, this, when you say this, this condition, you're, you're breaking up possible cinnabar into two parts, the part where mercury is toxic and the part where mercury is not toxic. Um, and you're applying the rule toxic to cinnabar um, only in this part where mercury is toxic. Now, in a disjunctive judgment, so now, again, suppose cinnabar was the subject of all the disjoints. Then we could say, like, either all cinnabar is red or all cinnabar is green or all cinnabar is blue or green. And um, however many disjuncts they are, there are, since, again, the point of the disjunctive judgment is that exactly one of them has to be true. That means that if the disjunctive judgment is true, we must have an exhaustive list of all the ways cinnabar, cinnabar, all the ways cinnabar could be. Right, it has to be either this or this or this. And then, you know, each one of these, it's going to depend on some external condition, what it is. 
the disjunctive judgment doesn't say what all those external conditions are, but it has to depend on it, right? Um, so, um, so each one of these conditions is external to cinnabar, right? If something is something, then cinnabar is red. If something is something, then cinnabar is blue. If something is something, then cinnabar is green. Now, um, uh, so each one of these by itself is like can't be derived from the nature of cinnabar. It's an external condition. But the, what the disjunctive judgment is saying is that all these external conditions together, so to speak, add up to the nature of cinnabar. That is, the nature of cinnabar is such that um, one of these external conditions must be true. Right? Because otherwise, this division wouldn't be exhausted. So I think that's the way the disjunctive judgment involves a kind of um, combination of internal and external conditions. Now, okay, but what if, what about the normal case where these are all different? Um, by the way, in, in this case, Kant gives an example like the one I was talking about, right? It's something like either the world came to be by, uh, by uh, absolute necessity or by chance or by freedom, or I forget exactly what the division is, but um, the the subject of each of the disjuncts is the same in Kant's example. But I mean, it's clear from what Kant says about it as a general matter that he doesn't think they always have to have the same subject, right? So this could say something like either all cinnabar is red or, you know, uh, all salt is yellow. <laughs> Um, again, it's hard to, it's hard to think how an example like that actually will come up in, in empirical judgments. Um, um, but so in that case, what is the nature, if we have a general one where like the, the subjects of the different disjuncts are different, what's the nature that we're dividing up? Um, and, you know, uh, I guess, um, It's not really a concept that's found in the judgment explicitly. It's some kind of state of affairs that has to be either cinnabar being red or salt being yellow or whatever. Um, You could think of it as kind of like the actual case. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, if you have to say that, then it's bad because obviously then the disjunctive judgment is really different from the other two. But on the other hand, if you try to say, well, you know, this is the subject concept. So, uh, so first of all, there's nothing about the ju the the judgment that 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 singles out this one as opposed to any of the others. So that doesn't seem 
Right. And also, if you thought of it as a judgment just about A, and trying to decide whether A is B, then it would really be equivalent to a lot of hypothetical judgments. Yeah. So Kant and like Aristotelian logic in general doesn't really recognize conjunction as a form of judgment. I'm sorry, I really shouldn't be spending that much time on this, and especially because um, I have no idea if you guys are even following what I'm worrying about at this point. Um, are, are there questions about what the hell I'm talking about or anything? <laughs> I'm never lucky enough to get those. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I want, I want to just stop talking about this and say somehow this can be worked out. But the problem is I need to go on to explain the three different types of syllogisms. And the three different types of syllogisms are, so like, remember, a, a, a syllogism uh, tries to explain the conclusion by, um, as Kant explains it, um, in the in the major premise, we give a rule that applies on a condition. In the minor premise, we subsume something under the condition. And in the conclusion, we then conclude that the rule applies to that thing that we've subsumed under the condition. So it's that's very easy to understand in the case of a categorical syllogism but Kant really emphasizes right like he says that his predecessors have made a big mistake because they they thought that categorical syllogisms were the only important kind and all the others could be reduced to categorical syllogisms or something like that and he says uh you know no that's not true there's three different types of syllogisms because there's three different types of conditions that you're subsuming something under and that and then, you know, the question is, uh, where is the condition and what are you subsuming under it? And if you don't understand to begin with what the structure of the judgment is, then that question, which is, which is plenty hard by itself, becomes even harder. So, but maybe I should go on to talk about the different types of syllogisms and, and maybe you'll understand better what it is I'm worried about, right? Because so the syllogisms, therefore, are there's three types of syllogisms because, um, again, there's a major premise. So the major premise is contains a rule on a condition. And then there's the minor premise, which some subsumes under the condition. So, by the, so Kant says, this is a function of the understanding. This is a function of the faculty of judgment. That is, we've taken this judgment, this rule on a condition, and applied it to a case, which is, that's what the faculty of judgment is for. And then we have the conclusion. Um, so let's say this, you know, this subsumes X under the condition. And then the conclusion is the rule applies to X. So the reason there's supposed to be three different types of syllogism is because there's supposed to be three different ways that a rule can be uh, asserted on a condition. And those three different ways are, 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 are the three different relations of judgment. 
So, I mean, from which we can understand that that's what relation of judgment means, according to Kant. It means like the um, the relation is the relation between the condition and the rule. Um, so in the case of a categorical judgment, so, and again, when I was talking about this last week, uh, it, it became clear that Kant wasn't using the terminology of rule and condition exactly the way I am or exactly the way I think he would. Um, I mean, because, but what I would say is this is the rule this is the condition. Now that's not exactly what Kant said, and um, but on the other hand, what he does say is that in the minor premise, we subsume something under the known condition of the rule. So that this is definitely the condition. I guess the question is whether somehow he called the whole judgment the rule. And the condition is part of it, right? But in any case, then this conclusion is X is B. Now, I mean, so I wrote it as X rather than putting in another concept here. Um, um, X is like a case to which the rule might or might not apply. But in real life, we're gonna to have to use a concept to represent that, that case, right? Like we can't represent objects at all without both concepts and intuitions. So even though this, this case sometimes gets a proper name like Caius, right? So we say like all humans are mortal, Caius is human, therefore Caius is mortal. Um, um, that doesn't really mean we can represent Caius without using a concept. Yeah, I mean, normally I would say the concept we use to represent Caius is human, <laughs> right? So that Caius means this human, the one named Caius. Um, of course, if the condition itself is human, then that's unfortunate because it turns everything, makes everything analytic. Um, um, but, uh, but anyway, there's, there's some way of doing that if you want the, if you want the conclusion to be a singular judgment. But it's easier to understand if we make the conclusion itself a universal judgment, right? So then, you know, we can just put a concept here, here like this. Well, maybe that is somehow what's confusing me, though. Maybe that's what doesn't carry across perfectly to the other two forms of judgment. But in any case, right? So here we understand how it works. Um, but then, okay, so that was a categorical judgment. But I'm, now let me try to do it with a hypothetical judgment. So a hypothetical, uh, sorry, a hypothetical syllogism. So a hypothetical syllogism has a hypothetical judgment as its major premise. But now the other two premises on the surface, they look completely, the pattern seems to be completely different, right? This is how the hypothetical syllogism is going to go. The major premise will be if C is D, then A is B. The minor premise will be C is D. And the conclusion will be A is B. So what have we subsumed under what in this minor premise? And what have we concluded that the rule applies to? Yeah, so this is driving me back to, this is what I always used to say about it, but now I've been trying to get out of it. But 
Maybe we can't get out of it. This, you have to somehow bring back that X. Um, you could think of it this way, where X names like the actual case, the actual state of affairs. You're subsuming it under the condition that C is D. And then you could say, ah, see, now the rule applies. That is, the actual state of affairs is one where A is B. Now, I mean, these, these aren't really judgments, right? I mean, because this isn't the concept. This isn't the concept, but uh, but that would be kind of a generalization of subsuming something under a rule that would be appropriate here. Then what is the condition external to? I mean, now this just looks like a categorical judgment. So that's what pushes me back to say, no, the judgment is about A, and the conclusion is about A, and the rule is B, and this is the condition. Well, maybe that, okay, maybe that is right. I mean, maybe we should really kind of look at it this way. I don't like that, actually. Wait, you can't. This is, this is the subsumption we're doing in the minor premise. You, I mean, you can't really write it this way precisely because this condition is external. It's not really something about A. Um, but what corresponds to subsumption here is, um, in terms of a picture, We're saying that A has to be in the C is D part and not in the C is not D part. Right? This whole circle is possible A's, and this is the part where C is not D, and this is the part where C is D. And this subsumption is so, I mean, because it's an external condition. Uh, Um, subsumption 
is based on a difference, a possible, a difference between possible A's rather than the identity of possible mm -hmm. A's. Yeah, maybe that's the right way to think about this. I've, I've, as you can probably tell, and as it's probably irritating, I've been worrying over this for years. I've read things about it that, that people have said, and they, they always, they don't seem to help. <laughs> but maybe this is the way, to, I guess the test is, is this going to help with the disjunctive judgments? A disjunctive syllogism. That's the question. And again, I feel it, I feel that it's gonna fail there, but let's see. So I mean, let's keep the major premise simple. Right? Either C is D or A is B. Well no, I think we should have at least three. Or E is F or A is B. And the minor premise is going to be um, so the minor premise in this case is itself going to be disjunctive. Yeah, maybe actually let's just stick with two, right? So the minor premise now is going to be C is not D. And the conclusion is going to be A is B. So what is the rule, what is the condition in the major premise? And we say that, can we still say that B is the rule and Maybe it is better to add another one. Right, so the minor premise will be, it's not true that either C is D or E is F. Uh, although this is exclusive or. So that would be consistent with the both being but oh no, but we're saying they can't both be true. That wasn't the major premise. Okay. They can't both be true. So if it's so if it's not true that that exactly one of these is true, it has to be true that A is B. So, so to speak, this is the condition. That just makes it look like a hypothetical judgment. 
Okay, I, I don't think I understand this very well. Um, I wish that Kant gave more examples <laughs> or any examples. And I've already spent uh, like almost an hour trying to untangle this. So I probably need to go on to something else. Oh yeah, so someone asked a long time ago, so this relates to transcendental illusions of self, world, God? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I want to explain how. Um, I want to explain how the the fact that there's three different types of syllogism translates to those three transcendental ideas. Um, so we can see why Kant thinks that those are the three transcendental ideas. Um, um, and so we can see what it is that reason is going to ask for a guarantee of. So basically, right, so these three different types of syllogisms. So let me just write the three different types of syllogisms again. Categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Now, um, so uh, what I was saying about syllogisms in general last time, according to Kant, is um, that a syllogism is supposed to explain why the conclusion is true. And it, um, it unifies the conclusion by giving it a single explanation, right? That's the unity of reason, which the understanding doesn't contribute, right? So when I judge all cinnabars red, um, I, uh, um, um, I put the manifold of sensation of cinnabar together in order to apply a predicate to it. But I don't um, put all the cases where that predicate applies to it together to give them a single explanation. That's the unity of reason as opposed to the unity of the understanding. So it's the, it's, it's the same cinnabar, but now rather than being regarded as um, a manifold of different like experiences of something, it's being regarded as a manifold of different cases where a rule applies to something. That and right and, and that's why reason, as Kant keeps saying, doesn't apply directly to mm -hmm. objects, but rather to the understanding and its judgments. So, um, um, and what I was claiming, the, the way the transcendental illusion works, what I was claiming last time is, the, the way it works is, so it's like reason is trying to, I mean, we're trying to do something parallel to what we did in the transcendental deduction for the categories, basically. That is, if, if this works, instead of the dialectical inferences of pure reason, we would have the transcendental deduction of the ideas of pure reason, right? So that is the concepts of pure reason would correspond to the analytic of concepts in, in the transcendental analytic. And that would show, that would derive the three ideas of reason from the three types of syllogisms. And the um, inferences of pure reason would correspond to um, well, no, I guess the inferences of pure reason would correspond to the principles. 
that is, it would list a bunch of inferences that are valid because of, and the thing that's missing is that the concepts of pure reason would contain a second part, which would be the transcendental deduction of the ideas of pure reason. Okay, so what would the transcendental deduction of the ideas of pure reason look like if um, it works? And I think, so I'm going to go back to talking about categor categorical syllogism just because, as we just saw at unfortunate length, sorry, this should be B. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, A should be in Okay. Um, as we just saw it, unfortunately, I don't really understand how the other two syllogisms are supposed to fit the same pattern. But, um, uh, then the case of the categorical syllogism. So, like, um, this gives uh, a unified internal explanation to why the rule B always applies to A. Right? Now we can say, why does the rule B always apply to A? Because all A is C. And C is a known condition for applying B. Um, so the function of reason that's being used in this syllogism is the function of providing an internal explanation for the truth of a judgment, internal to the subject. Um, now, how do we, how are we supposed to get from that to the idea of the self? So, um, So if the parallel to the transcendental deduction of the categories works, we would say um, reason must be able to um, exercise this function. And I think Kant thinks that's right in a way, but the way it's right is subjective rather than objective. But, you know, so, but, but what we think is reason must be able to exercise this function. So just like we said that, I mean, in effect, we said that, like, like I have to be able to represent cinnabar as one, for example, because cinnabar has to be fit to be the subject of the universal judgment. That is, the understanding has to be able to carry out the function that it of um, applying a predicate to something as one with respect to every empirical concept, for example, the empirical concept cinnabar. So like the metaphysical deduction of the category of unity was that, as I just said, I have to be able to do that with respect to any empirical concept. Therefore, every empirical concept uh, must be able to represent its object as one in order to uh, a function as possible subject of a universal syllogism. And um, um, and so if we have empirical concepts that are legitimate, and that's what the transcendental deduction tries to show, uh, then uh, like 
um, it's guaranteed that the understanding can unify the manifold of sense in the way that's necessary to represent an object as one. And that's what surprisingly allows us to make a, this kind of demand that's based on the needs of the understanding, but that um, sensibility, the manifold in sense has to obey. Um, it's surprising because what manifold occurs in sense doesn't depend on me. It depends on the object that's affecting me. So, you, so it might seem like magic that I somehow am able to tell it what to do, to tell it that it has to do the thing that it needs to do for me to be able to unify it in a certain way. Um, but, um, uh, the transcendental deduction, um, argues that I wouldn't exist if the if the if the manifold and sense didn't obey that. Right. And again, that's why I kept saying that it was Kant's version of Descartes' cogito arguments. That it's I can't deny that I exist. That is, I can't deny that I'm a unified consciousness. And I tried to explain why I can't deny that. Okay. So the analog here would be that um, uh, reason says, well, it must be able, I'm, reason must be able to carry out this function with respect to every judgment. So every judgment must be fit to serve as the conclusion of a categorical syllogism. That would be the conclusion. Um, So um, I say that that would be the um, that would be what the transcendental deduction would have to show if there were a valid transcendental deduction there. Um, and like I said, I think Kant thinks that's right in the sense that. Um, um, when I make a judgment like this, I'm opening myself up to the demand for that type of explanation. So in that, so every judgment is the conclusion of a possible categorical syllogism in the sense that making a judgment at all, um, when I make the judgment, I don't supply the explanation. Again, right? All I I only supply the unity of the understanding, not the unity of reason. So, um, so when I make the judgment, I don't supply a unified explanation, but I can be asked for a unified explanation because if I don't have one, then uh, how do I know that it's true? Um, so, uh, um, so if you, if you work the transcendental deduction that way, what you get is the regulatory use of the idea. In this case, the regulatory use of the idea tells me to look for an internal explanation for all my judgments. Right, like if I if I find that all cinnabar is red, um, I'm not done because even though the understanding is satisfied, right, like it's exercised its function and unified the manifold of sense and whatever, um, there's a there's a legitimate demand left over that I haven't answered, namely why is all cinnabar red, and you know what is it about cinnabar that makes it all red? Um. So um, that's right, but it, that doesn't tell us anything about what the object has to be like.
It's just advice to me. Um, so like that's the sense in which it's guaranteed that this is the possible conclusion of a categorical syllogism. It 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 puts me in a position of looking for such a syllogism. That is, reason instructs me to look for such a syllogism. But um, but the illusion is, this is the transcendental illusion. The illusion is that something about the object of the syllogism has to guarantee this. Now, what is the object of the syllogism? Well, I mean, so again, reason doesn't directly represent objects. That, you know, that is the part of the syllogism, again, that I'm saying that's analogous to the subject of the judgment is the conclusion. And the conclusion is not a concept that represents an object of the judgment. Um, but in a way, there's a there's a there's an object represented here, namely this the object of the subject concept of the conclusion. Right. This is what the whole syllogism is about. It's about A. Right. So if the conclusion is therefore all cinnabar is red, then um, what we're explaining, so to speak, is the manifold of, of cinnabar. And so now reason says um, something, in, I mean, I guess I should say, it's, it's not, of course, the manifold sensations of cinnabar, it's cinnabar that is the object that's responsible for this, right? And so now reason says, well, there must be something about the object that guarantees that I can find an explanation like this. That's the transcendental illusion. I mean, at least that's the first step of the transcendental illusion. So, I mean, when you but when you say something about the object, of course, it can't be something about cinnabar that guarantees it, right? Because again, the idea is that we're supposed to be guaranteed of finding an explanation like this for any judgment, whatever its subject is. So something has to guarantee it about the, uh, something about the object has not insofar as the object is represented as cinnabar or gold or anything else, but just insofar as the object is represented as an object at all. And that's the transcendental part. Right, that we're going to look for something about the object, object as such, objects of empirical judgments as such that guarantees that there's always explanations for all these every judgment about them. Okay, so how, how could that be? I mean, 
again, it's an illusion, right? So, uh, so Kant thinks this isn't true. We don't represent the object in some way that guarantees this. Um, again, what we really do is we judge about this the object in such a way that this is that this is guaranteed to be a good question. What's the explanation? But the illusion is that we represent the object in such a way that this question is guaranteed to have an answer. So when we say it's guaranteed to have an answer, um, now, I mean, this is confusing, um, but I'm about to talk about this ascending series of syllogisms that Kant talks about. Um, So, so far, I mean, this one syllogism is an answer to the question about how do we know that A is B, but um, it just leaves over a separate question. I mean, it actually just leaves over two separate questions of exactly the same kind, right? Like, okay, now explain why A is C and explain why C is B. Um, However, I think, I wish I could explain this better. I think from examples, and so first of all, Kant says that there's a series of, this leads to a series of prosyllogisms. Now, I mean, so like here's a way, and I think this is the right way, you could get a series of prosyllogisms out of this. So the prosyllogism is going to have as its conclusion the minor premise of the syllogism you started with. Um, so now C has to be the rule of the prosyllogism. And then you need a new middle concept. Right? So that's what the pro syllogism is going to look like. And then you do the same thing. So you have another syllogism where the conclusion is A is D. Right? And then the minor premise is going to be E is D. And the major premise is going to be Um, um, no, sorry. <laughs> My premise is going to be A is E. The major premise is going to be E is D, and so forth, right? And you just keep going back to like explain why A is B. Well, it's because A is C. Well, but why is A C? Well, it's because it's D. Well, why is A D? Well, it's because it's E, and so forth. Now, I mean, in principle, you could get a similar series going from the major premise, um, and then, but also like it would branch at every point, right? Because you you want to explain this and this, and then this is gonna, right? So you wouldn't just get one series if you tried to explain both of the premises. So I I think um, 
I think Kant thinks that what, what you're trying to um, this, the principle, the major premise, the principle that the syllogism starts with is just like um, I mean, this is not satisfactory, but at every stage we take this major premise like as given, so to speak, and the actual explanation, the internal explanation is, is finding the condition in A, subsuming A under the condition. So at each one of these steps, we're getting, so to speak, farther and farther into A. Um, we're finding a more fundamental internal condition. So, I mean, even though it's true that like in the grand scheme of things, these are also judgments and we can also ask the same questions about them when we're, when we're trying to find a complete explanation for why A is B, what we're looking for is this series of, well, because it's C, well, and why is it C? Well, because it's D, well, because it's E, right? So, um, um, So, I mean, this series obviously could keep going back forever. And um, if A is an empirical concept, um, we're, uh, it is, we aren't going to get to an end of this logical series. Because the fact that it's an empirical concept means, and I think this is what Kant means when he keeps, this is why Kant keeps saying um, that, uh, experience is always conditioned. Why is experience always conditioned? Um, because, so, like, first of all, why is that relevant? Well, because if we got back to, in this series to something where um, uh, you didn't need to subsume A under any condition to conclude that A is X, a is unconditionally X, then that would be the beginning of the series. Um, but uh, but there can't be a beginning of the series like that. Like it's because it's act it's actually true that every empirical judgment leaves a question like this open. Um, that is so. That's another saying that experience is always conditioned is another way of saying that, right? That is, however I represent an empirical object, I'm always representing it that as that way on some possibly unknown internal condition. And why is that? Well, because, you know, that it's empirical means that, um, um, Its full internal condition is not in me, it's in the object. Um, right, so like by definition, you know, experiencing an object
Right? Here's me, and here's the object. Experiencing the object means um, recognizing that I can apply a rule in some case because of a principle that's not in me, but in the object, right? So the rule is my empirical concept. This would be A, right? Um, and I recognize that I can apply A in this case, right? This case might be really big. Um, it might be all cinnabar, right? But I'm, but I've recognized that I can apply my concept A in this case. Why am I able to apply the concept A in this case? Well, it's because of the principle that's in the object. This is the real answer, right? It's because of the principle that's in the object. Um, so uh, if I later learn that, uh, you know, this, all these applications of A can be explained because this case is a case of C, and C is a known condition of applying this, of applying, uh, well, sorry, I didn't follow, follow things out right, but, um, B. Right, this is the judgment, all B is A. Um, yeah, the judgment consists in recognizing that the case supplied by A can be represented according to the rule B. But the reason the rule B can apply to this case is again, is because of the principle that's in the object, it's not in me. So I can later learn an explanation for why the rule applies to this case, namely that, um, that this can be subsumed under some other case, possibly bigger case, which is known to guarantee that B applies. But why, right? Like, why does this case guarantee that B applies? And again, the answer is because of a principle that's not in me, it's in the object. And that series of explanations can never end because, um, um, if it ended, that would mean that the concept I end up with is the nature of the object. That is, I would be, that would be an intellectual intuition, which we don't, which we're not capable of. So experience is always conditioned. That is experience always ends, you know, however many explanations you give, in the end, you have something that you know is true for some reason, but you don't have the reason. So it's true on condition of some reason that you can't supply. And again, you can supply you can supply a reason, and then you've gone one step, but there's still that leaves another question open. There's always a question like that open, and it's true by definition of experience, basically, right? It's again, it's because the full principle that explains what's happening is not in me, and it never will be. Um, now maybe. You can start to see how this is getting to the idea of the noumenal self. Um, because reason says, but there must be something about how we represent any object of experience um, that involves representing uh, that 
of these questions is all guaranteed to have an answer. So I have to, um, um, So there has to be, so to speak, something somewhere in the object that, um, that contains an unconditional explanation. And I must be able to represent that now, right? So I think this is when I said before that it's confusing. Um, the, in that logical series of prosyllogisms really is, it's a series and it goes step by step, right? And you can keep going forever. Um, this, what the, the correct regulative employment of reason tells you to do is also a series, right? It tells you to keep looking for those higher conditions that will provide higher explanations and not to, to, re to just rest with unexplained judgments. Um, but the, the, the dialectical inference of reason, where it concludes that there must exist a, a certain kind of object, namely the object, and that, that object is going to be the object of the transcendental idea, right? So that, that, um, that dialectical inference doesn't go through a whole bunch of stages, it just goes in one step from the conditioned to the unconditioned, right? That is, it, it's, it, it looks at this picture and says, well, obviously there's never going to be an unconditioned explanation in that series, no matter how far you go. But I must be representing the unconditioned explanation already. Because again, we're thinking that uh, um, we must be representing every empirical concept in a way that guarantees that there's an unconditional explanation of uh, the truth of every empirical judgment about it. So I must already be representing this unconditioned explanation. So right away, that means that's what makes the, trans, the transcendental idea an idea, that is, as Kant defines it, a concept whose object could never be met with an experience, right? It could, its object can never be met with an experience because, again, experience is always conditioned. And this concept has been introduced as the concept of an unconditional explanation. So it's been introduced as the concept of something that could be met with an experience. But it's claimed that we know that it's there. This is what it means by calling it inf an inferred concept, right? Like we don't represent its, we clearly, we don't represent its object the way we represent cinnabar or other rep objects of experience. Um, uh, but we represent it Every time we represent any object of experience, we're representing it as having an unconditional explanation. And so like by a kind of inference, we're representing the object of that concept of an un unconditional explanation. And what would the unconditional ex internal explanation look like? Um, well, um, it would be, uh, a principle in me that matches the principle in the object. <laughs> right. So it's not like I used to think that the conclude that that the first transcendental idea, it seemed like it should be the idea of substantial form or something like that, right? That is inside cinnabar there should be something um that unconditionally explains everything about cinnabar and then it's hard to understand why we're getting the concept of a self here 
But I think the point is, again, like it can't be anything about Cinnabar that guarantees this because it's supposed to be a, it's it's supposed to be a guarantee for any object of experience. Right. The object represented just by its transcendental predicates, that is, we represent it just using the categories. And from it, we infer that there must exist the object of this other idea, of this other concept. And this other concept is the concept of something unconditioned. So it's not the concept of any empirical object. And yet somehow it contains in itself the guarantee that the empirical facts will have explanations. Um, and so... Um, that has to be, um, um, there's still something I don't quite understand about this. Again, it has to do, it has to do with that question of the relationship between the concepts of inner and outer and the difference between self and and non-self for example between internal sense and external sense why does the internal condition I don't know. I mean, maybe it's clear enough from this picture, actually. The point is that looking for an internal condition is looking for a principle in me that guarantees that the judgment, that explains why the judgment is true. Test will be if we can if understand how it's different in the case of a hypothetical judgment, for example. But anyway, so uh, if we if I don't think about that yet, I'm looking for a principle in me that explains why the initial judgment was true. Now, um, but then I realize that all those explanations will still be conditional. So I say. Therefore, I must be representing myself as containing an unconditioned explanation. Yeah, so like I said, one test will be, um, but obviously I'm not gonna have time to do this today. <laughs> one, one test would be, uh, can you make that work for the other two transcendental ideas? I mean, it seems reasonable enough, right? The other, like the second transcendental idea is gonna be the idea of a world of the world as a whole. And, you know, so, so in that case, the problem is we're explaining by means of an external condition. Um, but this external condition always depends on another external condition. So again, experience is always conditioned. But then I think Okay, so there must be something that's not conditioned that contains all the external conditions put together, and that's the world. And the case of the idea of God is is trickier, but I think to understand it, you have to realize that um, you have to at first think of the concept of God not as the concept of a thing at all let alone of a thing that actually exists, but really just as the con as the, the sum of all possibility. That's that's the fundamental transcendental idea in the in in the third part, I think. 
then like we'll see how that gets transformed into the idea of a certain being that actually exists like we make further mistakes basically Kant says um but really like what we say there is we must have a complete representation of all the possibilities in order to rule out all of them except the one <laughs> that's like the big disjunctive judgment um okay i am out of time i hope that was um, I hope that was a positive addition to your understanding rather than just a complete subtraction from it. <laughs> I I feel like I myself am getting closer and closer to understanding this, but I but I don't know if it helps you to hear me struggle with it or not. I guess it depends what you think what we think you should expect to learn from this class if we think you should expect to learn the true one true interpretation of kant and remember it forever then this lecture was probably not very helpful but um but if we think you should learn something like how to look at a difficult philosophical text and struggle with interpreting it then maybe this lecture was helpful <laughs> all right anyway uh uh um yeah so next week i guess we'll see a different test of this namely if i can use this what i just said to explain in any way the actual content of the paralogisms of pure reason <laughs> all right so we'll talk about that then um okay bye